So, welcome to all of you, and let's just jump right into it, shall we? Okay, so I think when many of you saw the title, some of you wondered, okay, what, what symmetries, what similarities are there? And is it a similarity between all Celtic and all Native Americans? So first let's start by saying no. I'm going to focus on specific groups, so it's clear. The whole Celtic world is wide, the whole Native American world is even wider. What we're going to focus on are Irish and Welsh legends from the point of view of the Celtic part, and from the point of view of the Native Americans, Hopi, Navajo, Yao Yo, do I not know that? That's from Peru, and Maya. Okay? There are hundreds of Native peoples. And the Celtic world also extended originally from Austria, if you know, that's actually where it began, right? In Halstaff. Um, up to Brittany and including Galicia in northern Spain. So we're going to limit it, okay, right now. Now, you must understand that it's specialized in Renaissance studies. That means we go from the late 15th century through the mid 18th century. My technological skill is about in those centuries. <laughs> start very briefly before the legend, so I'm just going to do two or three minutes of quick history. The Celtic world that we're talking about extended as far as, we don't extend it as far as Turkey. The Celts were walking all over the place. 2,500 years ago, Celtic tribes literally walked out of Central Asia. Some got as far as Northern Turkey and stayed there. Most went into the area that is now Austria. Um, and the first Celtic finds were actually in, in the Hallstatt salt mines in Austria. And then they keep on walking, and they keep on riding. You know how important horses are in Celtic culture. Think of Epona, the horse goddess. Very, very important in both Irish and Welsh culture. And the walking and the migrations will take them actually to northern Spain, which kind of gets cut off there. Um, and it, it is from northern Spain that the groups, the Celtic groups that reach Ireland and Wales will arrive. And that was about 2,300 years ago. So the first thing I want you to understand when we talk about Celtic mythology and legends is that what is Celtic is also pre-Celtic. Okay, so a lot of the figures in Celtic mythology, have any of you ever heard of the Tuatha de Danann, right? The people of the goddess Danann? Yeah. Uh, that's actually pre-Celtic. And it becomes absorbed in Celtic culture. Okay, so that's very quick run through of Celtic history. Okay. Now, the point of origin? Okay. Ah, yeah. Well, it's Spain. It's just the theory, right? So the point of origin is actually Switzerland and Austria. Okay. Um, and then the tribes go in different directions, but what you know of this Celtic culture, what most people recognize of this Celtic culture, um, is of course that which reaches Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, in England, and of course Ireland. So now let's, very quickly, we talk, I have to talk about Amerindian migration. Don't worry, we're getting to the good stuff. The story coming very quickly. But I do want you to have, a, have an understanding, okay, some general stuff. The people that we call Native American, including um, the Hopi and the Navajo, who are two of the oldest peoples of Arizona, how did they get here? Through different groups, okay? Many of you have heard they only came from Asia, correct? Well, they didn't only come from Asia. Through DNA studies and through anthropologists who are themselves Native American, we know now they came from all over. About 80% come from Central Asia before the first ice, excuse me, before the last ice age. So they had gotten here about 18,000 years ago. But they kept on coming. It wasn't just one march. Gee, let's go follow the mammoths into North America. Nobody knew North America existed, let alone South America. These were migrations that begin 18,000 years ago. They go through, you see where it says ice-free corridor? Because that ice was pretty horrific. And they come by sea and by land. Hunter-gatherers following the mammoth. 
It begins 18,000 years ago, and the last migrations finally reach the Americas about 3,000 years ago, and the last peoples to come are the ones who you mistakenly call Eskimo, who you should actually call Inuit. Okay? The term Eskimo is kind of a nasty term given by other Native American peoples to the Inuit, so you can now you can see their attentions. Why do I mention that? Because as you will know, among the Celts, among the Native Americans, it is not one unified group. And that point is really important to remember right before we start the legends, because the legends tell of a lot of friction. Okay, so there you see the main roots, one from Southeast Asia as well, but the one I want to point out to you that might be kind of surprising to you, do you see the, the root that says Salutrian? So guess what? We now know that roughly 15,000 to 10,000 years ago, some other immigrants crossed the ice sheets when the ice was beginning to melt. And if the ones from Asia came looking for mammoths, the ones from Europe, specifically Northern Europe, specifically Scandinavia, came looking for seals. And that's why many Native American peoples also have Scandinavian DNA. It was all from Thorhaya Dolls County in Norway. It was long before. Okay, so the DNA is mixed, the cultures are mixed. Okay, so what do these people have in common? That's what we're going to talk about now through the legends. I have. Is that a great picture? We have to thank him before we do it. Um, there are three points. Let's see if you can concentrate on me while you look at the dragons. And I don't get to the dragons. There are three points that I'm going to repeat. As you say in Latin, ad nauseum which will really make it clear regarding what the cultures share. Celtic culture and these particular Native American cultures that we're going to study here tonight have three points that make them very different from other civilizations. The first, the number three. Plenty of cultures have the number three. No, what do I mean? In Celtic culture and in these particular Native American cultures that we're going to look into, there is no clear dichotomy no clear division between good and evil. There is good, there is evil, and there is something in between. As we all know, most human beings kind of fall in that, don't they? Right? Much less of a, a clear division between good and bad. There is night, there is day, and there is twilight. It's a separate time. Most cultures throughout the world tend to look at things in terms of opposing opposites, right? Celtic culture and the Native American cultures we're going to look at don't. And in fact, this even refers to time. In traditional Celtic culture and in traditional Native culture, there is no past and present. Past and present coexist together with future. There is just one time. And think of that because it's a very different perspective from the one that we live with every day where we all feel we have no time for anything, and we're going from point A to point B. In Celtic culture and in Native American culture, it's a circle. It is not one line to another one. So, the number three. We don't have opposing dualities. We have lots of shades in the middle. That's point one. Point two. These people could never, the Celts nor the Native American groups we're going to talk about, get together to form an empire. They did not like centralized authority. If you had three Celts, you had four opinions. If you had two, and you still do. <laughs> I know, I was in Ireland. I did my year abroad from Argentina in Ireland. So, yeah. When you have two Native Americans, you generally have four opinions. <laughs> and in both cultures, the role of the Shanahi, the storyteller in Irish culture, the storyteller in Native American culture is the most important person on the planet. And they argue. In the Mayan Indian language, the same word for to speak is the same word for to argue. I think I was trying to So, they never got together under any centralized empire, and they are rebels, and they rebelled against their own leaders. So when the Romans showed up in Ireland, later on when the British showed up in Ireland, 
or the Norman French Ireland had gone through lots of invasions. It was kind of like, hmm, same, different day. And they kept on fighting whoever came, because they already fought their own. When the Spanish conquistadors showed up in the New World in the 16th century, the Mayans fought them, because they'd already been fighting the Aztecs. And they'd already fought their own leaders. They're always fighting. That's actually a good thing, because if you're a little group of people, you're not going to withstand an empire if you try to fight that empire in an organized way. So the Celts and the Native Americans developed another style of fighting the empire, which is if you flushed out one village somewhere else, another one popped up. And so the Celts were always very frustrating to the Romans, because the Romans claimed they ran through the forest naked, painted themselves blue, and you could never catch them. <laughs> and with the Mayan Indians, every time the conquistadors would flush out one village, another village would literally improvise itself in its place. So this rebelliousness, let's call it this factiousness, also characterizes them. Okay, so let's recap. We have the number three, not the duality, and the rebelliousness. So there's never a Celtic Empire like there's a British Empire. Oh, that was a loaded example I just gave. <laughs> there was never a Mayan Indian Empire like there was an Aztec Empire. Please avoid those documentaries on the History Channel at 3 in the morning. <laughs> there was a Mayan Empire. Because there was no Mayan Empire, there were over 17 fighting city-states. Okay, like you know the Celtic division of Ireland into five kingdoms that hated each other's guts. Right? That's what it was. So please ignore those documentaries and please ignore that man who claims everything comes from outer space because it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing because you know who it is, right? It's all extraterrestrial, right? You are extraterrestrial. The third point, so we have the number three, we have the rebelliousness, and the third point, shape-shifting. Now this is something very particular in Celtic culture that later goes into Norse culture. That's the only other European culture that is going to kind of approach Celtic culture in this attitude towards changing form. In Native America, so what does shape-shifting mean? Okay, the same thing in Celtic culture as in Native American culture as in later Norse culture. The idea is there is one spirit that animates everything. So it's in that chair, and it's in the heel on some. And it's in everything, because everything is, if you want to use the word holy, sacred, I'm going to use. Okay, why am I using sacred and not holy? Can anybody tell me? Do I just feel like showing up my English vocabulary? What difference might there be between sacred and holy? Go ahead and show up. And do it in Spanish and show up. Sagrado is something. So, holy would be connected a bit more with established religion. I'm using the term sacred, sacral, okay? Because that can be something spiritual outside of established religion, okay? And everything is sacred because everything comes from one spirit that takes many, many forms. So in Celtic tradition, the, well, do we say the sorcerer? This is not Dumbledore from Harry Potter. <laughs> And it's not the image of Merlin you know. You're going to see an image of Merlin when he was mere then, when he was Celtic, before he kind of got bowdlerized and became 12th century French, British, and then shows up in later movies like Camelot, that this is not what Merlin was. Merlin was not a sorcerer. He would have been a man of sacred secrets, the same way that the storyteller or the shaman, do you know that word? In Native American culture, when I ask you to know that word, I'm not assuming that your brain did. I am defining this because if there's one thing that I hate, I'm an academic, but I hate a lot of other academics, and I particularly hate a lot of academics. We show off stupid words, okay? Like let's foreground the binaries of the whatever. So I'm going to define what it's going to The term shaman actually comes from northern Siberia, where you see some of the native peoples came, right? When they came down from Asia. Shaman in the Tunga language of northern Siberia, language still spoken, literally means the one who cures. 
Okay? And that's probably interesting because you know all the sacred men of the druid of the druids of the Celts called the Druids were also the ones with the medical knowledge. So because everything is holy and everything is sacred, everything comes from the same source. I can turn myself into a frog, that's irrelevant because my essence remains the same. Now, if you think this is just silly magic, I'm going to use an explanation that I heard, I don't want to tell you how many years ago when I finished my DA, back in the late 16th century, when I was just backpacking around Ireland, England, and Scandinavia. And in all of those places, in, okay, this is the late 1980s, so you can kind of guess how old is it? Don't say it. Um, before internet, there was still a lot more oral culture, okay, also in Ireland, much more. And you could talk with people in pubs in Galway and in Kerry who really had more of a connection with the older traditions. And we were talking one day, after one of the only drinks I like, because I hate to tell you I don't like beer, it's horrible, you do not listen to me anymore. <laughs> but one of the only drinks I do like, and I like it very much, is Bailey's. So, <laughs> so you can buy me that. So after God knows how many bellies, one Irish Shanafi I was talking to in a little village called Puck, where they have a very famous fair. There is a goat that's dressed up like a human being and shape changing. Said to me, you know, you think this is a magic idea, he said to me, but let me tell you from a traditional Celtic point of view, the idea of cancer, he said, is kind of un incomprehensible. The idea of cells changing the shape. I want you to think about it. Because we accept that this happens scientifically. In Celtic stories and in Native American stories, everything can change shape. And the idea is that the shape is irrelevant. Because, for instance, dragons, are they real? Of course they are. Not some dimension. Dragons are not just dragons, they are the earth and the sea. Okay, so now let's start with the stories. In the Andes in, in South America, from southern Peru down to southern Chile, there are two dragons that are always at war. And they are Tren Tren, who represents the earth, and Kai Kai Filu, who represents the sea. Now, why don't one of you guys tell me, or guys or girls, which one represents the sea? The blue, right? And the sea is blue. And so, Kai Kai Filu is down there on the bottom, and Tren Tren, red, brown, the earth, okay? The sea and the earth <coughs> are in constant dynamic interchange, and according to the legend, one day Kai Kai Filu got tired of always having a subservient position down there on the bottom, and made the waters rise up, rise up, rise up, and so Tren Tren had to make the land rise up, rise up. What large mountain range do we have down there in South America? The Andes. So that's where the Andes come from. Okay? And Tren Tren and Kai Kai Filu, if you notice, are in constant combat, but if you look at this picture well, they're also making love. Well, it's a typical relationship. <laughs> because, remember, one and two make three. And so, in order to have the functioning three-tiered universe, above, below, and the middle world, I just use the term the middle world, Tolkien did not invent that. <laughs> that term has been used by every Native American civilization and it was used by the Celts. Ooh, thousands of years before Tolkien thought about it. Okay? So, we need Kai Kai Filu and Feng Feng always going at each other's throats and making love, and both of the same at one time. Because without that, we have no world. So you do not have, in this particular mythology, these are, oh, these are the Indians who are called the Mapuche. By the way, people often ask, because if you watch those silly documentaries on the History Channel, they'll say, the vanished people. And they'll show you a lot of mist. <laughs> <laughs> All this mist. These people are not vanished. They live, they exist. There are half a million Mapuche Indians in Argentina and another million in Chile. So these are living people. Um, people don't vanish. So, it is not a bad thing that they are in constant dynamism because the idea is, in order for there to be three, remember the balance, 
in Native American and Celtic perspective is not two, it's three. You need the earth and the land together to form the world. Ah, uh, now we get a little closer to home. Have you ever heard of Mordecai? Anybody ever hear that name? You ever hear King Arthur? For sure, you know. So, if we get Celtic about the story, and you can try to take out of your heads films about King Arthur, which usually anglicize or even francicize King Arthur, please forget the film catalog. Those of you who remember it, I actually remember it, right? Vanessa Redgrave and Richard Harrison. That was about as Celtic as I am Japanese. <laughs> the film Excalibur, which came out a little bit later, also about as Celtic as I am Japanese. Um, in the Celtic story, <clears throat> Merlin is much more important than Arthur. Okay? And there was a king at the time that Mirvin, which they used to call him that, Mirvin was a little boy named Vortigern. <coughs> And he had a real problem keeping his castle up because the walls were always falling down. And it was the child Mirvin who told Vortigern, Your Majesty, it's not that your construction workers are inept, so, so we know it's not the 21st century, it's because you have two dragons battling underneath you. But look at the colors. These dragons do not just have accidental colors. One is red and one is white. The red dragon represents the Saxons, who Vortigern, very stupidly, invited to Ireland to fight the Romans. And the Saxons loved Ireland so much they decided, I think we'll stay. That's how the English first came to life. That's the beginning of the whole very tragic story. The white dragon represents the Celts. And Vortigern, when he finds the dragons, asks the child Mirvin, how many years is this going to go on? And Mirvin says, it will go on for upwards of a thousand years. So we're talking about prophecy. That was back in the early 5th century. So the dragons here represent a constant battle. But it's not something bad in the Celtic stories. Because Mirvan tells Vortigern, we both of us need that struggle to create our heroes. I think that's also interesting. We both need this struggle to create our heroes. Maybe in 21st century psychological terms, we would say to define ourselves, right? So the two create three. And in the middle, you see the Celtic cross, which, as you know, was all over Ireland long before St. Patrick's showed representing exactly the same thing that it represents in Native American culture, which are the four corners of the universe. And I hope you know that the American Southwest, where we all are all right now, is called by the Hopis and the Navajos the land of the four corners. So you have this idea that, again, one and two together makes three. It is not a bad thing. Oh, they're really going in. And the idea was that for thousands of years you would see the red and white dragon struggling in the sky, and then one day they would make peace. Underneath it, you see an image that you wouldn't have seen in the time of Mirva. So, what do you see there? Who are they? What do you call those people with that armor? Nice. Nice. Except in the time that we're speaking about, the ancient Celts did not have knights like that. And they wore very light armor, much more like the Native Americans who wore cotton armor. And that's what the Celts wore as well. The dragons represent two cultural forces that come together and will create a new culture. And there will always be a little bit of Irish in England, and there will always be a little bit of England in Ireland. So James Joyce, one of the greatest writers of all time, said, I'm taking an intellectual revenge on Britain by writing Ulysses. <laughs> Some of the greatest Irish writing in the world is in English, and we would not trade it, right? Yeats, Joyce, Manga, Ferguson, I you see everybody love it. So it's not a bad thing to create a hybrid, and so that's 
Were you ever good or bad? Is it sometimes circumstantial? So you have many heads. You have many heads. The number three. I'm good against you. Oui. Let's talk about something nobody wants to talk about. Let's talk about it. Because this is where things get problematic. Was there human sacrifice in Celtic culture? Was there human sacrifice in Native American culture? And we have to answer this very carefully. The pictures you're looking at are from a 16th century Spanish codex called the Florentine Codex. And it shows images of pretty, harsh, by our standards, Aztec human sacrifice. But the Aztecs were not the only Native American group. In fact, they were actually the only Native American group to practice mass human sacrifice. Did the Celts have human sacrifice? They did it more. In the early part of their history, and we're going to see that they get rid of it in the same way that the Mayan Indians and the Mapuche Indians and the Yario Indians get rid of it. What I'm saying to you is it is a controversial practice. It was a controversial practice 2,000 years ago, too. Why would you have human sacrifice? Why would you kill somebody in the name of God? Listen to what I just said. Why would you kill somebody in the name of God? Is that only in ancient times? We don't know anything about that. <laughs> so there are different types of sacrifice. So the conquistadors looked at the Aztecs and said, Hey, yeah, it's horrible. But what about the Spanish Inquisition? That was a load of fun, wasn't it? The Romans looked at the Celts and said, I always think that they were naked and painting themselves blue. That's what's happening. How could the Druids sacrifice people in the wicker man? Although we know that a lot of those reports were also semi-invented, and we're going to talk about that as well. But there were some sacrifices, and they were nice. I'm not going to defend them. Did the Romans have any sacrifices? The civilized Romans? Yeah. Like a circus was a little worse than the way circuses are today. It was gladiatorial comedy. So what I'm telling you first is you have to be very, very careful about judging peoples when the only chronicles about them are written by the people who conquered them. But that being said, there was some human sacrifice in Native culture and there was some human sacrifice in Celtic culture. But because the nature of their cultures was rebellious to begin with, we're going to see that both the Celts and the other Native Americans, with the exception of the Aztecs, get rid of the sacrifice. This is one of the greatest gods of the Andes, and boy, you can see he is angry. He is a monk. Paria Casa, and then we're going to have another image here. Show I can work that. The Bog sacrifices? Okay. Um, in places from, from Denmark to Ireland, people have been found in bogs. And the traditional knowledge always said these people were sacrificed. Some were, some weren't. But some were. There was a connection between Maria Casa and the bog sacrifice. 